Good afternoon, guys. I'd probably better introduce myself first off and explain why I'm talking to you about COVID-19. My name is William Flint, and um, I really hold two positions. One is uh, the fun job, which is head coach of Croydon Gymnastics Club. And then I have my day job, which um, you know, allows me to, to live. Uh, my day job is I'm a senior health and safety consultancy, uh, consultant, and I've covered areas such as Legionella, asbestos, um, nuclear industry, and most recently, extensively COVID-19. Um, so I won't pretend I have all the answers, but I, I aim to give you uh, some guidance, my, my opinions, um, hopefully share a risk assessment with you and uh, field any questions you may come across. The first thing I'd like to do is to uh, do the uncomfortable part of the session where I shatter illusions and ruin dreams. Okay, anybody who thinks we're going to be returning to a normal means of operation is deluded. The way we used to coach, the normal operation of a gym is now gone. It's not going to come back. It will not come back. And by the time we actually get to a situation where the, you know, the old normal is possible, you'll be so used to coaching uh, to COVID-19 regulations that actually it will feel abnormal. COVID-19 is here for at least the next two years, possibly longer. Whether or not we'll have all the restrictions in that we are going to have at the end of that two years remains to be seen. Nobody has the answer to that yet. Not the government, not the experts, nobody. We don't actually know how this virus is going to uh, continue mutating. The bad news is it has already mutated. Um, the current strain, which is uh, SG916, is 10 times more contagious than the original uh, that broke out in uh, Wuhan in China. It doesn't actually produce any worse uh, symptoms yet. You know, it still can kill you, but it's not necessarily going to definitely kill everyone. Um, but it is 10 times more uh, contagious than it was previously. So it will continue to change. So they're the first points I would, I would make. That effectively, we're not going to be back in the gym and just doing what we were doing. Okay. So where shall I start? COVID-19, I'd like to just touch base on how it's transmitted. Um, you've all got a little icon button there, which should show you either a thumbs up or a show of hands or you know, me or whatever. Can I just ask the question, do all of you know how COVID-19 is transmitted or do all of you think you know how COVID-19 is transmitted? Please give me a show of hands now, either physically like this, give me a thumbs up or, yeah? So everyone thinks they know about how COVID-19 is transmitted. What are the three ways? Well, actually four ways as of this morning. What are the four ways of transmitting COVID-19? One is coughing on people or sneezing on people, i.e. transmitting the virus in terms of um, an aerosol. Okay, that's number one. Number two is by contact surface. So sneezing on something or contaminating a surface, then picking it up and translating it to your mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, all the kind of yucky stuff that you were told not to do as a kid. Okay, the third method, bodily fluids. Okay, blood, urine, sweat. All the things that nobody remembers, or certainly BG haven't remembered in their risk assessment, and we come across on the gym on a day-to-day -day basis. Kids do get nosebleeds. Small children do have accidents which need to be cleared up, all of which have the potential to actually spread the virus if not contained properly. And the last factor, which uh, who are currently talking about as of this morning, is airborne virus particles not associated with aerosols. So in other words, bits of virus blowing around um, untethered, which is a means of contamination I don't think we've necessarily seen before. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it's transmitted. So the first question you're going to ask me probably is, how do we prevent this becoming a problem in the gym? What do we do? And everyone's going to start quoting back at me BG guidelines or government guidelines. Okay. The guidelines you're going to receive are going to be broad. They're not, they're going to be non-Pacific because no governing body, no government can ever give you a site Pacific set of constraints. Teaching gymnastics in a trampoline environment is different to teaching gymnastics in, for example, a rhythmic environment or an artistic environment. It's all different sports, all different means of supporting, all different, all, all different equipment and constraints. So the guidelines are always going to be loose. 
you know, they're, they're, they're a strategic statement of what should be. So we come down to your risk assessment, which I, I emphasize your risk assessment, not BG's, not my risk assessment, but yours. To enable you to reopen your club when we finally get a green light, you're going to have to have in place two, well, three pieces of paperwork. The first piece is a gateway. That's called a risk assessment. And that is a document that looks at the risks that you think you have in, the, in, the, in your gym. Now, what I would highlight here is you have to consider 360 degrees safety. No one wants a risk assessment just for COVID-19. Because when you look at COVID-19 in isolation, you know, we could do things like, you know, wet cleaning on equipment. I don't think you can wet clean the tramp trampoline bed. In fact, I know you can't. You can't wet clean the beam and still use it. So you have to consider all aspects of the risk assessment, not just COVID-19. We'll come to that in more detail. That will then move on to what's called a safe system of work or a method statement if you have a construction background. A safe system of work is your lesson plan. How you're going to move people around your gym, how many you're going to have in, what they're going to do, which direction they travel in, how you manage things, for example, like changing, using the toilet, supporting. All those interesting things that actually no one's really got to uh, uh, grab the thistle on as yet. And the last one that comes out of all of this is fundamentally your policy statement. What is our COVID-19 policy? Where do we stand? What do we stand for? Why do we stand for it? All of that kind of stuff is covered in, in your, in your COVID-19 policy. So let's talk about risk assessment. Okay, what kind of things need to be in your risk assessment? How do you do a risk assessment? Anyone got any ideas? I um, looked at the BG site and the government site on their templates and then added obviously what we needed for trampolining. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I will share with you, if you can email us over your uh, email addresses, I'll share with you my uh, example risk assessment. Now, I think you need to consider various things. You need to consider first your normal operations. Again, show of hands, who's gonna support gymnasts when you go back in the gym? We've got a rig, maybe. I will be, because I believe it's more dangerous not to your kids are going to want to do all the skills they were doing beforehand. And let's face it, if you're going to have a, a gymnastics session, we'll be coming in. We, okay, now go and do a forward roll. I've never done one before. Okay, trust me, you'll be fine. That's really not a gym, a gym session, is it? Gym coaches have to support. So therefore, we need to consider how we're going to do that safely. Okay. What else do we need to have in our risk assessment? We've got normal activities, equipment, people, movement, COVID-19. What else is going to be in our, in our risk assessment? So if we've got normal activities, we must therefore have abnormal activities. First aid emergency. Someone has got a, a, a bloody nose. Maybe someone's had a heart attack. We have to give CPR. The guidelines on CPR, everyone here is probably a first aider, correct? The guidelines on CPR have changed dramatically. And if you were to give someone mouth to mouth at the moment, mm, that's a no, no. Okay. The correct way of giving CPR currently is to cover their face with a cloth. Okay, so whatever's coming out of their mouth can't be breathed in. So it's the same as putting them into a mask effectively and then carrying out chest, chest com uh, compressions. And if you have a defibrillator using that. But again, it's about managing expectations because if we have someone who's you know, receiving CPR and we put a cloth on their face, it doesn't necessarily look like we're really helping them, does it? It's kind of counterintuitive. Oh my God, oh my God, you're trying to smother them. No, this is, this is the correct way of doing things right now. So all that kind of detail needs to be wrapped in. What about fire, uh, fire emergency? How do we evacuate the building? What are the risks involved there? If the fire alarm goes off, does that automatically mean instant panic? Everyone run out of the building? Or does it mean we evacuate in an orderly manner? Maintaining social distancing if we can. The only constraint when you would breach social distancing would be for argument's sake, if you saw smoke or fire, at which point obviously you have a more pressing risk. That's the sort of thing in my mind that should be documented. So let's talk around this, this whole risk assessment bit a, a bit in a bit more detail. So 
in the first instance, let's talk about all the easy to do stuff. Okay, the easy to do stuff. How do we get people in? Well, how do you stop COVID-19 coming into your gym club in the first place? Because just based on the pub experience on last weekend, there's three pubs who've been closed down on the back of three cases of COVID-19. So we're open, yay! Oh, we're closed. How do we avoid that situation? Can we avoid that situation? Because it is reasonably certain that you are gonna get uh, someone with COVID-19 trying to enter your gym. Of that, we can be pretty certain. How do we stop them? The very first line of defense we have is not letting them leave the house. What my club are doing, what we're developing at the moment is a questionnaire. So effectively, before a gymnast even comes to the gym, before they're allowed in, they answer a health surveillance questionnaire, which says, this example, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'll give you some examples. Do you have COVID-19? Believe it or not, some people still think it's just a flu. Have you been exposed to anyone who may have COVID-19 or is currently being tested for COVID-19? Do you have cold and flu-like symptoms? Can you still smell and taste as you did three months ago, for argument's sake? That type of question. If the answer to any of those is, you know, in the negative, yes, I may have a COVID-19 uh, exposure, I'm really sorry, but you're not training tomorrow. That's our first line of defense, because the only opportunity we have to stop people bringing COVID-19 into the gym is to stop them at the door. And we can only do that if we ask questions, which of course feeds into your you know, privacy policies and everything else, but it does need to be, and it does need to be considered. The next thing we're gonna do is when people actually arrive at the door, we're not gonna let parents in the building. The first thing we're gonna do is limit the number of people we have coming into the building, because less people, equals less potential forces of contamination. We're then going to ask them the same questions again, because people quite happily just tickle the boxes on, the, on their computer screen. When you ask the question directly, you may get a different outcome. And again, oh, I've got a bit of a cough that I developed this morning. Again, I'm really sorry, but you're not training today. We're then going to take the temperature using um, an infrared th uh, thermometer. And any temperature over 37.6 is going to result in that gymnast not training that day. And the same goes for coaches. I don't want to sit coach in the gym any more than I want to sit a sick gymnast. The only way to keep people safe is to keep them out of the gym. The, the old way of I'm training through a cold or I'm training through an injury, it should never have been a thing anyway. We shouldn't have been doing it. Now you've got an added incentive. It's really straightforward. If you're ill, you don't train. That's our first line of defense. That's the only way you're going to keep COVID-19 out of your gym because it is going to come back with a vengeance. We've got till September effectively to eradicate it. Okay. If we haven't got rid of COVID-19 in the UK by September, maybe October, we have a COVID-19 and, uh, and flu season as opposed to just a flu season. So just painting that, that picture now. The pandemic is not over and will not be over for, for the foreseeable future. We need to learn to operate with it. And that does mean we're going to have to be more careful. Okay, so that's the first, first possibility. That's our first opportunity to, to conserve our gyms, keep our gyms open. The next thing we need to do as part of our risk assessment is to consider how we manage it if we do get a case of COVID-19. Does one person coming in the gym automatically close your whole gym? Or are there things we can do to make your gymnastics delivery more robust so you can actually weather that storm? Now, the first thing I would suggest is actually we could work in pods or bubbles or groups or whatever you want to call them. Again, how I intend working in my gym, and I know how other gyms are, are intending to work, is to work in smaller groups. So rather than having 32 kids turn up for a recreational gymnastics class. We're going to bring in eight every 15 minutes. And we're going to stagger them through our gym. So we're going to have the first eight come in, we'll warm up, then move to the next station with the same coach. So we link permanently those eight gymnasts as a pod with that coach. And then they follow them in the gym quite happily. And that's the plan. So again, if we get one case of COVID-19 in that group, 
the group needs to be tested. The coach needs to be tested, sure. But with the cleaning procedures we have around it, what more do we need to do? If we're sanitizing and cleaning each area after each rotation and then being moved on, the only people being exposed are potentially the people within that group. Which brings me on to waivers. Who thinks a waiver is a great idea? I promise that I definitely will never ever sue you if you give me COVID-19. Who thinks that's a great idea? Show of hands, please. What an enlightened group. No, it's a terrible idea. Waivers do not work, cannot work, okay? It is not possible to pass over your liability for health and safety. We are talking about a health and safety issue, okay? It is criminal law. So it's not possible to transfer your liability onto, onto others and a waiver won't work. What I suggest you do do is communicate clearly with your parents about what you are doing. And making, you know, making everybody aware that actually we cannot remove risk. It doesn't matter what procedures we put in place in the gymnastics environment, there is always going to remain a risk. What we can do is limit that risk as far as reasonably practicable and therefore comply with the law. But there's always a risk. If we open our gyms again, there's a risk somebody will get COVID-19 and if we don't manage it, it will, it will become a hotspot. Please don't, don't think I'm, I'm overplaying this. It is that contagious, it is that dangerous, okay? We're sort of 43,000 dead already and counting. So it is a serious problem. Anyway, so waivers. Information good, waivers bad would be the first thing I, uh, I would say. Getting someone to sign that, you know, doesn't matter if they get COVID-19, no, sorry. You can't do that, okay? The next point, after you've given people information, some will want to return, some will not. As a straw poll, Roughly 33% of the gym want to get back in the gym immediately, no matter what the circumstances, we all know who they are. There's roughly 33% who never want to come back in the gym again because it's too dangerous. And there's another third who want to come in when it's reasonably safe. So, I'm, where are we? Okay, got another, I've got a first question. We'll answer that one in a second. Um, so you, you can see there is a public concern around this issue. In terms of bubbles, okay, ventilation in terms of, of, of uh, COVID-19 is good. The more ventilation we have, the better. Some of the larger gyms are achieving 12 air changes an hour. Now, it depends how big your hall is, and it depends how many gymnasts you can have in that hall based upon the BG guidelines that have been issued. Now, Stepping away from BG guidelines for a minute, your minimum social distancing is still two meters. Okay. If you're working without PPE or other specific reasons, your minimum social distancing is still two meters. So that means if you stood one child still, they'd have two meters by two meters, because every child having two meters by two meters means you have a two meter square um, space, four square meters rather. Um, that's the absolute minimum. Now you're allowed to move a little bit, which is how BG's got to two metres by three metres, I think. Okay. Most of the gyms I've been working with um, on this matter are allowing far more space than the BG guidelines. The more space, the better, is a simple, simple guideline. The problem we have is we don't all have that kind of luxury to go, okay, we've got this... 35 square meter area, we're going to put six kids in. We can't all do that. And it is a question of working with what you think is necessary, what you think is comfortable. Now, when you're making your risk assessment, the best piece of advice I can give is that to justify a decision, put it in a worst case. If I had to stand up in a court of law, a criminal court of law, and I'm facing either a 25,000 pound personal fine or six months in prison, am I comfortable with the decisions I've made? Because if I'm not comfortable with the decisions I've made, I've probably made the wrong decision. That is the balance of, of, of risk you're taking. Okay? The Health and Safety Work Act 1974 governs this particular field, as does the COVID-19 um, COVID regulation 2020. Under Health and Safety Work Act, section two, as employers, 
we must put in place safe systems of work that ensure the safety not only of our employees, but also those not in our employ. That is the exact wording, or more or less exact wording. Those not in our employ are all those using the gym, or volunteer coaches, or anybody else who might be affected by our undertaking. Okay? There's absolutely no way around that problem. Every one of us, I believe, charges for our, our gymnastics training. And because every one of us charges for it, it's not a volunteer activity. It is a business, at least as far as the health and safety regulations are concerned. I can't comment on tax. I'm not qualified. Okay? That is the, the, the level of, of certainty you want to have. So when you think, okay, I've got a hall of exercise. I can have 12 gymnasts in there with two coaches. Make sure you're comfortable with it. The reason I chose bubbles of eight is it sticks with current BG guidelines in terms of coaching ratios. That's the reason I went with eight. It keeps things effectively um, as economic as we can make them. So moving on, cleaning equipment. Some of you have trampolines, some of you have carpet roll mats, some of you have loops, various beams, bolts, God knows what else. Now, antibacterial, well, antibacterial sprays are not actually designed for viruses, but they, they work by breaking down the, the surface coating on the, on the virus. So they do work, but they're also wet and soapy normally. So if something's wet and soapy, it's going to increase your risk of turning your ankle or worse. So if we spray everything with an antibacterial spray or an antiviral spray and we make it slippery, we're increasing the likelihood of someone banging their head, spraying their ankle, breaking their arm. All of these things need to be considered in your risk assessment. Now, vinyl covers, sure, spray them, wipe them down. They'll dry quickly. Therefore, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be allowed to use the equipment rapidly, no problem at all, because it will be dry enough. That's part of your risk assessment. The vinyl wipe down, the equipment's dry. Now, can I treat carpets the same way? Can I spray those with, with antiviral, antibacterial spray? Obviously, I can't because they're not going to dry quickly enough. What I can do with them is, vac is vacuum them. And I have to vacuum them with a vacuum with a HEPA filter or high efficiency particle arrestor filter, also known as the Dyson or equivalent brand. I'm not advertising Dyson specifically. Um, would you do that every single rotation? It's your risk assessment. Most of our uh, COVID-19 is largely transmitted by us breathing it out. It lives within our airways. Therefore, if we have robust hand um, cleaning in place and kids are not doing this every five minutes, you know what grubby, horrible little things gymnasts are, if we can stamp that kind of behaviour out, actually, how much virus are we going to have on people's hands and feet during the course of a session? Do we need to actually worry about the virus being on their feet? Probably it's a lower risk. So probably we can actually vacuum less. So rather than being every 15 minutes, everyone's out with a dice for half an hour, probably once a day, twice a day, three times a day, whatever you think is necessary. I don't know your gyms. But at that point, you're dealing with something which is manageable. It doesn't become, well, cleaners first and coach is second. Now let's talk about special services like um, bars. Uh, wooden bars, fibre bars, whatever you like. I noticed Jim Nova put their fibre bar out as being COVID safe. I'm not quite sure how that works. Let me talk to them on that. What I would recommend in the short term is get your gymnast back on metal bar because it can be wiped over really quickly. Um, they've all been off bars for at least three months. So they're going to take their time to get the strength back anyway and repetition is uh, the key. Put them on metal bar, make them work metal bar. By the time they're actually getting all the skills back on metal bar, you're about ready to go wooden bar, and hopefully things will be shifting. Now, if you have to go to wooden bar, there are alternatives. Okay? You could, if you're a really, really mega rich club, or you have really mega rich parents, get every child to buy a bar, and it becomes their bar, in which case it can't be cross-contaminated. Yeah, I know, completely stupid. I have had someone suggest that to me. Okay? You can also treat them with UVA, which is ultraviolet radiation. Okay? 
if you're really that hell bent on being back on wooden bar before things are eased. Okay, they are available from uh, www.goodlight.com. And what it is, is effectively a light box which bombards a surface with ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the only drawback with that is if you stare at it, it will blind you after 30 seconds and it will increase your, uh, your risk of skin cancer. I don't know how badly you want to get back on wooden bar. Okay. So, in terms of bolts and beams, um, take a look at PG Foam. Um, we developed with them a a uh, stretchy vinyl cover for beams and bolts, which again, being vinyl, you can wipe it down. So it means you can actually get some volume through your, through your vault. If you're turning, if you're turning big Eugenkos, big sooks, you may have to come away from vinyl cover. It might be a bit slippery. Try it, see what happens. Okay, pits, jersey top mats. Let's talk about those now as well. So the jersey top, you know, the Gym Nova, really squishy ones. Um, again, all you can really do with those is vacuum them but the gymnast is impacting them differently to the carpet. So if they can, you know, if you're coming down your front, you obviously put your face straight into the mat. Therefore, the risk is greater. Therefore, they probably want vacuum cleaning more frequently. All being restricted to one or two gymnasts, for argument's sake. Maybe you're, you're working, I don't know, shoot fronts with maybe two gymnasts. It's quite an advanced move. So therefore, that block becomes theirs and no one else uses it. You could limit it that way. Pits, okay, obviously foam logs, great. A vital piece of training equipment. How do you keep them clean? You're not gonna empty out every session, sterilize every single log, are we? The only way you can really use pits currently is by coating them with a vinyl mat. 100 millimeter uh, thick, soft vinyl mat. It's not as good as a pit, but it's a lot better than a safety mat. That's, that, that, that's the compromise you have at the moment. I wouldn't go any thinner than 100 mil because you go beyond that, you, you're risking turning ankles and breaking ankles quite badly. Um, they're my thoughts on, on the equipment I'm familiar with. Trampoline beds, let's mention those while we're talking about them. Do have one or two of those. Uh, you can't spray them because they can't be wet because obviously your, your gymnasts are bouncing up and down, going to back, wherever else. Again, you don't want it slippery. And you certainly don't want to have, you know, be showered in antibacterial spray every time you gymnast some is off, off, off your trampoline. Yeah, kind of disgusting. It's bad enough when it's sweating on you. Um, what I would recommend is, again, vacuuming, uh, vacuuming them at a suitable interval. Again, for you to decide. It's your risk assessment. Okay. Um, rhythmic equipment. I think most gymnasts have their own. So it has to be a question of, no, okay. If they're sharing equipment, wipe down. If it's a textile fabric, don't use it. Try and get to the stage where it's either easily cleaned or there, or there specifically. Let's talk about um, moving through the gym now, bring a gymnast in. Lockers, changing. Very first thing to do is to get them to turn up in their leotard with a tracksuit on, okay? So there is no changing as such. You take your tracksuit off. Now, again, depending on your gym layout and how you want to operate, one of the good systems that I've heard about recently, a couple of gyms are using, is what they call in the bucket system. They bought a load of B&Q buckets. So each child comes in with a B&Q bucket. They get given the bucket on the door. Your shoes, your water bottle, your tracksuit, all goes in that. Okay, and that bucket goes with you from station to station to station to station to exit. So in actual fact, it takes out any risk of, I've got to go to the changing room 16 times to get my phone. The same bizarre reason. It takes all that kind of thing out. The bucket goes with the gymnast through the, through the one-way system that you've set up within your gym. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not the only way. There are others. I don't know all of your layouts. Okay. But the, the, you know, that is one way that we, we could work, is, is going to work. Two or three gyms have already got this set up. Toilets. Now, little darlings always want to go to the toilet, normally for a chat. Um, being COVID-19, they're going to go individually now. 
So that will take out the, uh, the, the, the chat issue straight away. So hopefully we get less of wanting to go to the changing room anyway. Um, secondly, cleaning. As a guideline, construction sites with builders who have been working right the way through this, I clean their toilets between twice a day and four times a day, depending on the site, depending on the risk profile. I will suggest with what we have going on, we're probably closer to four than we are two. So that has to be factored in. And that should include things like frequent touch surfaces within that area, doorknobs, toilet flushes, taps. Okay, all the things that people are going to touch with their grubby, disgusting paws on a regular basis. Okay. So we've now got them into the gym, we've got them changed. The other thing you could look at, depending on uh, your welfare position, how your toilets are laid out, quite often uh, changing rooms actually are pre lobbied so they don't actually need doors closed. What you could do, uh, what you could look at is wedging the doors, so again, it's one less contact, contact uh, surface to touch, to clean up with. That, that's an idea. Take a view on it from a welfare perspective. Okay, the less time they're pushing things, touching things, less risk. Okay, so we've got them changed, we've got them into the gym, we've got their um, well, belongings in a bucket. So again, when they put it to one side, they're gonna put it at one side, one at a time, possibly. Because again, we need to maintain two metre distance at all times, unless there's a reason to shorten it. Me getting more people in the gym is not a reason to shorten that, that distance. Two metres is the golden rule, and will remain so for the foreseeable future. You wait, uh, Boris on the, on the TV later today, just completely ruining everything I've just said, but we are where we are. Now, there are things we can get up in the to do. I personally am not a fan of supporting them every minute of every second of every day. I'd rather they, they learn that gravity works and the floor's hard. Um, actually, it makes them a little bit more um, risk aware and again, more self-confident. That's, that's my personal coaching approach. But we are going to have to support them. They've all been out of the gym for three months. They're all going to want to get back in there and do their Randolph flick straight back twist or double back or whatever your current poison has to, uh, happens to be. And there ain't no way any gymnast of mine is going to be putting a skill out like that until they've gone through the progressions and have been suitably and adequately supported so they can execute the skill safely. No way at all. So that means we're caught in between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, we're being told we can't support. On the other hand, we're being told we must support because we are primarily coaches. You know, most of us have gone through years of training to support and to make sure that our gymnasts land on two feet the right way up unharmed. That's still our primary objective. COVID-19 is just another barrier to overcome. So how do we do it? Actually, first, first question first. We have, well, I've already asked it once, let's just reiterate the point. Is everyone intending to support? Be honest. Okay. You know, let's, let's face it, if you could get yourself on bars and, they, and they, 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 do a, they do a fly away and it goes badly wrong, you are going to get in there and you are going to stop them breaking their neck, aren't you? And I am. And that's what we need to overcome. That's what we need to think about. So, can we put our gymnast in PPE? Does that sound like a great idea? Shall we put them in gloves and, and, and socks? I know trampoline gymnasts have to wear socks already, so please, exclude, please, please trampoline is, excuse us who are used to being barefoot. Um, personally, I would not be putting my gymnasts in socks and gloves because they will skid. And I'd rather have a bit more vacuuming to do than my gymnast turning their ankle on the first week back. Okay, so my view on, on that is maybe not. So bearing in mind the primary point of contamination from a gymnast is what they breathe out. Can we put them in a mask? Should we put them in a mask? What do you think? Let's have a show of hands for yes. So no one thinks we should put a gymnast in a mask. Let's have a show of hands for no. Yeah, we got there in the end. Yeah, cool. Okay. I agree with you. I don't personally think we should be putting gymnasts in a mask because when we get to do that Randolph flick straight full twist, where's the mask going to be? If it stays on, it's going to be over their eyes 
or around their ears or, or just a straightforward distraction. What's the greater risk? The gymnast breathing out some COVID-19 they shouldn't have because we've screened them coming into the gym or not being able to see the landing. In my mind, it's not being able to see the landing. So again, that's a reason for working back in these small groups, confine the groups. They all stay together. So we're managing risk by spacing people out in terms of numbers. That's how I think we should do it. Now, actually hands on supporting. Now, I, I, I'm a greater risk of COVID-19, I have high blood pressure. As I'm sure a few other people, uh, you know, effectively in the, in, in the Zoom chat. So how do I protect myself? Should I wear a mask? Should I wear a face shield? Should I wear glasses? Should I wear gloves? Let's start, at the top. Let's start with gloves. Who's, who thinks I should wear gloves? Show of hands. Are you going to be supporting your gymnast in gloves? I'm not going to be supporting my gymnast in gloves because I think I need to have a proper grip on them and I think I need to be able to feel what it is they're doing. You know that, that tense you get before a takeoff or when they're tumbling? You can feel when they're, when they're rotating. And I don't want to lose that by putting gloves on. And if I am wearing heavier gloves, I might squish them, I might damage them. It's, it's, it's a delicate touch, isn't it, supporting? You need to actually maintain that, in my opinion. Your risk assessment may say something different. If you want to wear gloves, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying my approach is I won't be doing that. I will be washing my hands more frequently, probably after each time I've touched one of the disgusting little things. But that's my approach. Now, am I going to be wearing a face mask, one of these big shield things? No. You could, but you're reaching up, you're reaching across, you're reaching round. Face mask, uh, you know, face shield, I'm going to be knocking it off every five minutes. It will change my depth per perception. If my gymnast does career into it, maybe it's dangerous to them. I don't think it's a suitable piece of PPE for what we do. So I won't be wearing a face shield. Am I going to wear a face mask? Bearing in mind the primary route of contamination, the primary risk factor is breathing stuff in. I am going to wear a face mask, yes. I'm actually going to wear an FFP3, which is a, particular, a particularly fine particulate mask normally used in the asbestos industry. You might decide that you want to wear a, a cloth cover. Fine, your risk assessment. Okay, I'm wearing an FFP3 because I'm face fitted. I've worn them for 12 hours at a time and they're comfortable. And I know they're going to protect me. So I will be coaching a mask. Maybe not all the time, when I'm more than two meters from someone, I'll come off and I'll talk to them normally on smile or do the grimacing thing that looks a bit like a smile like I do sometimes. Okay, that's the first piece of PPE that I will be using in the gym. Okay, now what about glasses? If I can't wear a face shield, there's still a risk that I could get contamination via my eyes, could get sneezed into, could get coughed into. Will I be wearing glasses, safety glasses? Because quite clearly, there's people in the room who are already coaching glasses. It's perfectly safe. And it present, presents no more risk to the gymnast. That is something I might consider. As we get to know more about the virus, we might decide that, okay, the glasses come off maybe. In the first instance, the approach I'm taking, because the risk group I'm in, is going to be a mask, is going to be eye protection, when I'm supporting. And I say... If we're waiting for BG guidelines on how to support, I don't think we'll get any because it, it's a rock and a hard place. By getting closer to someone, you're increasing the risk of transmission for COVID-19. That's a simple fact. There's nothing we can do to avoid that. But if we are going to have kids in the gym and we are going to produce a fun, safe, challenging gymnastics program, we need to be coaches. And that means we need to support. So therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to justify what I'm doing in my risk assessment. So if I was to be challenged, why did you do this? I have it written and documented. Because I, I don't fancy prison. Okay, so that's kind of grasped of the, 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 the supporting aspect of of gymnastics possibly. 
where would you like me to go next in real terms? I've, I've ram rambled at you for 40 minutes so far. It's probably about time I started taking some questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions you've got. Or you can add them to the chat. There must be a few. There's always some questions. Let's just go through the list to make sure I haven't missed anything so far. Uh, The yeah, question um, that he asked on the group of eights and bubbles, surely they would shut the whole um, gym down if one of the group of eight got them? If one of the group of eight got that, they'd have no justification shutting the whole facility if you could prove it was clean. Right. Okay. The pubs that have been closed down, they, they haven't had to close. Ah, oh, right. Okay, then. Okay. They chose to close because there was a report, all the members of staff have been tested and they have a robust cleaning method in place. So they weren't forced to close. They elected to close. Yeah. Nice that they're waiting for the test to resume from the staff, that it does for a day and reopen. So there's already that case law in place. It, yeah. it is possible, it is doable. And that, do you advise that, that the um, kids bring their own hand, hand sanitizers and um, wipes, etc.? And how often do you think they should use them? Okay, I, personally, I would like them to bring their own stuff because, yeah, it's going to be cost a small fortune and uh, everyone's skin is different. And what I don't want to do is provide some sort of gel mm. that... Uh, having said that, we're going to go through gallons of it. So the recommendation is if you have um, skin allergies or skin problems, by all means, uh, bring your own, but you know, you're, you're going to have to make some available. Uh, I've, I've made lots available, I just wasn't sure whether to tell them to bring their own as well. Yeah, well, we might keep your cost down. Uh, we okay, had... someone just asked a question about schools and leisure centres, and yeah, I had this one on Monday. Okay, are we a school, are we a leisure centre, are we a gymnastics club? It's the rule of duck. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, it's probably a duck. So if we're coaching gymnastics during school hours as part of the school curriculum in a school, we're probably working to school rules at that point. When we get to the end of the day and the school says, school's closed for the day, we're no longer a school. We're probably a gymnastics club then. Now, I know there is a loophole there. I know that you know there is a way that some people are choosing to extend their, their, their day. It's a loophole. Enjoy. Can you justify it in a court of law? That's the question that needs to be answered first and foremost. You know, managing risk and managing the COVID-19 pandemic is as much a series of moral, moral decisions as it is following guidelines. You know, the, the example I'll give you currently is, um, you're allowed meetings of up to six people in the open air from separate households currently. So as soon as that came in, everyone's posting on, on, on Instagram and Facebook, oh, look, we're training outside. Okay, so we've got one coach and five kids, so that's six people, next to another coach and five kids, which is another six people. Is that two meetings of six people or is that one meeting of 12, which is illegal? Because really, it's one meeting of 12 people, which is illegal. I mean, even when a, even when a stage further the other day, when I actually saw someone supporting someone outside, you know. But we've gone to a park and we've took five gymnasts and then there's been another gymnastics club there as well. How does that work out then? Totally different. We wouldn't know the other gymnastics clubs there and they're like, like 200 metres from us. Couldn't two coaches from the same club be 200 metres and have five? It's one separate meeting of six people. You're fine in that situation. But also think about the public image that's being portrayed. Okay, you know your two separate gymnastics clubs. Does everyone else watch you know your two separate gymnastics clubs? Because one of the things that will come out of this whole pandemic thing is going to be no win, no fee solicitors. All people seeking to uh, leverage their position, gain compensation because they've witnessed something which they don't think is right. 
the construction industry saw it you know, almost day one of the pandemic break, uh, outbreak. I've seen your builders doing this. Here's a video of it. I'm going to post it on social media. I don't think it's right. What are you going to do? By the way, I quite like 500 quid, please. We're going to get exactly the same thing. We all know, you know, we, we, we've all seen, you know, what can happen in terms of um, no win, no fee solicitors. Think about it in part, as part of your risk assessment. Think about it on how you present your club externally in, in terms of social media. So I'm a colleague that's, um, on communication, hopefully has made these points. You know, yeah, great, fantastic, we're back training. My advice is that actually, if we rush back to it, I'm prepared. You know, in real terms, are our gymnasts going to be any better because we've, we've saved two weeks or three weeks? Are they going to be that much better in the round in six months' time? Probably not. Um, what are we running for our sport broadly? Uh, AMV Rhythmic, uh, get your hand up. Would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Okay, okay, maybe no hand up. Okay. Okay. No. okay. Uh, any other questions or should I uh, halt the recording now? Um, I just have a question. Um, sorry. Um, I'm looking at the face masks and I'm still at a point where I'm not sure if we should wear them or not wear them, just based on the fact that if a child does catch or if a child gets injured because of a piece of PPE that we're wearing, I'm sure that BG then won't have R back in there. So where does that sit? It, it sits with your risk assessment. Ultimately, um, BG, speaking as a coach, not as a health and safety advisor for a minute, um, I think broadly, coaches will be um, left to their own devices if an allegation like that came across. My child's been injured because your coach was wearing a mask. I don't think BG particularly would get involved. I think it will come back to the risk assessment that you've written. You know, ultimately, a mask is a, cloth, is, is a cloth item. It's not going to cause any harm. Uh, you know, there are rubberized masks, there are plastic masks, there are, that kind of, there are that kind of stuff out there. But why would you choose to wear it when there's other things which are soft? It's, it becomes very, very, if you get into a catch 22, if I wear a mask and my child gets strangled on it, well, I, I don't see that as a foreseeable outcome. A foreseeable outcome is that a child is going to bounce into your face and possibly wipe your mask off. Now, the, the straps on these masks are not very robust. They will break. So the worst you're going to have to do is possibly replace your mask, I think. But I, I, can't, I can't foresee how a fabric face mask is going to cause any more damage than that. If anyone else can, please, please, please chip in. I mean, the best way to do a risk assessment is as a team. What I've suggested to everyone else who's been on these calls is actually, let's share. Okay? I'll happily send out the work I've done for my own club and for others. Quite happy to throw it out there. Okay? Take my thoughts, evolve them, throw them back at me. Tell me where you think I'm right, tell you where, where, where you think I'm wrong. You know, bounce your thoughts off me. Okay? Happy to do that. If you want to ring me up and have a conversation about any, any topic, my telephone number is 07708 237 980. One more time, 07708 237 980. My email is william at priorityrisk.co.uk. Please do send me stuff over. People already are. Okay, if I have to spend hours writing stuff for you, then that becomes a work job. Can you repeat your email again, please? William at priorityrisk.co.uk. Okay. Okay, if I end up having to write everything for you, then 
I'm probably going to have to charge you for it. If you want to send me a document and say, am I on the right lines? Do you think this is right? I'm not going to charge anything for that. Ring me up and say, I've got a problem with this. What do you think? I'll give you an opinion. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, in our region coming back from the pandemic in as good a shape as we can be. Because actually, it is challenging for everyone. Um, I've had the advantage of managed to work right the way through the pandemic and, you know, I've done okay so far. That's good. Long may it continue. But I know, you know, gymnastics is a sole income for a lot of people and I want to do as much as I can to help. So please do take advantage of me. Thank you very much, Will. Any final remarks for the recording or should I stop it now? Can you just tell me again what sort of vacuum cleaner we're meant to be using? Anything with a HEPA filter, so a Dyson or equivalent brand. Did you say header filter? HEPA filter, H-E-P-A. <laughs> okay, thank you. High efficiency particle arrester. Okay, thanks. No worries. What's your contact details again, please? Yeah, sure. 07708 237 980. Email is william at priorityrisk.co.uk.